All right. I yes. keep it um, as short as possible. And when I tried it at home, it was 40 minutes. So uh, <laughs> city marketing <laughs> or city making, um, for me, is actually the same, right? And um, I can skip the introduction part. The only thing you need to know about myself is that I'm originally from Belgium. Spoke Flemish with my father, French with my mother. I speak German with my wife when I'm angry because German is a very good language to be angry. And the Canadians totally ruined my accent um, because my company is from Vancouver in Canada. Um, we're like 25 people. We have offices, two, three people, uh, in Austin, um, in Amsterdam, and in the Gold Coast in Australia. So although we're small and we want to stay small, we don't have the ambition to become a uh, multinational, we are very international at the core. And probably that's the only thing you need to know. So for those people who are already tired, but I don't think so because it was a great presentation by Joe, uh, the takeaway of my presentation is actually this slide. It's all about ownership, right? Who owns the name of a place? And I learned that the hard way three, four years ago. And I'll tell you a little story. I was asked to speak in San Diego in California. And because I, I'm like 200 days away from home yearly, I had to make up with my wife and my kids and I took them to a trip alongside the West Coast, uh, California. And my thought was to end in San Francisco. But, you know, kids when they're 70, 80 years old, they negotiate. So this city was not negotiable. This is Portland in Oregon. And I was really flabbergasted, like, what? Portland? But when I got there, I started to understand it. Like, it's all about the residents. They tell you stories and they all tell you the same st stories. They tell you about voodoo donuts. They tell you about the fact that at Halloween, everybody dresses up like vampires and they're dancing 24 hours on one song, Thriller by Michael Jackson. They have the smallest public garden on the planet. It's so small that only a leprechaun can live there. Um, they have the biggest number of street food trucks in the USA. They have the biggest number of craft breweries and so on and so on. How does that come? It did not come overnight. It did not come spontaneously. It's documented on the internet. You can look it up. 15 years ago, residents came together, they gathered, and they said, we need to do something about the reputation of Stump City, as it is called in the US. And they came up with that uh, framework of storytelling. And that's the result of all that. And they said, these citizens, we need to do something about our reputation because reputation precedes value. So what about value? Everybody has immediately, when you talk about value, euro signs or dollar signs in their eyes. I always tell it with this story, a tale of two cities, not by Charles Dickens, but by Frank Capers. Uh, it's about two cities in the state of Tennessee in the United States, and they both have approximately the same size of um, uh, population. And they both have the same value proposition. They are music cities. But if you are going to look on the internet and you look for their footprint, there is no comparison. One city is called Nashville. And over the last two years, you had uh, 8,500,000 conversations about Nashville and they have a sentiment that is quite high. On the other hand, um, you have Memphis. They have the real thing. They have BB King, they have Elfies, they have Graceland, but there is no competition between these two cities, right? Higher sentiment and significantly higher volume for Nashville. Now look at their economic performance as well. Look at their tourism performances as well. That's a big difference, right? So, this is really about ownership because in Nashville, it's the same thing that happened. It's the citizens that came together. And if you don't believe me, go to Nashville. If you arrive in the airport, and as you know, the arrival sections are always the most underwhelming part. It's great. It's, you see all the electric guitars of your heroes from Dylan to Johnny Cash. You will see upcoming bands playing for free. 
You go in a cab, they play the Nashville sound, you go to your hotel, they refer to the Grand Oli uh, concert venue, and so on and so on. That's the Nashville experience that is actually created grassroots uh, wise by the citizens. So my point is that place making is place marketing and that place marketing is place making. Both are uh, inseparable. And I think I need to say something, but that will be very small about place making the way I understand it, what place marketing is and why I say that place marketing is also place making. And you will get one parting thought. So place making. And I took a photo um, of Toronto. And that's not coincidence because my simple, humble definition of placemaking is that placemaking is a Canadian hobby. You can't believe how many great place thinkers come from Canada. And that's strange because it's such a huge country and they have only five urban centers, right? Um, but you have Brent Odarian, the used to be the urban planner of Vancouver. And you know the memes on Facebook of one bus and 50 cars to the left, that's Brent. You have Taras Grisco from Montreal, Strap Hanger is a book you absolutely should read. But my favorite is Charles Montgomery from Toronto. He wrote Happy City and he puts happiness of citizens actually in, uh, in front of everything. And I'm curious whether Joe knows him, but I know a guy, he's Spanish, Daniel Quercia, but he's a PhD and he teaches at Cambridge. And he takes that book and he's a big data analyst. And what he's doing is creating alternative routes in cities based on uh, sensors, the data you can scrape. And that's how he's working up the experience. You can have a happy route, the shortest route, the most beautiful route, all different paths but there is a thought behind that it's spreading of tourists and visitors as well okay i can't avoid to talk about jane because she's the mother of urbanism um she's partly canadian she's also she has a double nationality she's also from the us and i think this quote pretty sums up um what she stands for cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. So you know the story, Jane lived in New York and you had the Uber urban planner, Robert Moses, who wanted to create a motorway through Manhattan. She stood up first alone, she was writing little pieces in newspapers, but then there was a whole bunch of people suddenly behind her and she won. It's actually Jane Jacobs who launched the um, famous expression, the urban village, which is the living part of a city. Um, this is the start of the, the grassroots movements, the bottom-up placemaking. And Moses, of course, is the symbol of top-down placemaking. I seriously think you can't have development in a city anymore without at least having the two. So like Joe already said, if we think about placemaking, we think immediately about the physical space design. This is a cool example um, on uh, Times Square in New York. But of course, like she explained also, there is a lot of, um, and people forget about that. There is a lot of placemaking uh, online as well. Um, to give you another example, I help and advise a company called PlaySpeak in Vancouver, and that's all about consultations of citizens when authorities are going to um, launch a new project or there are new investments, and they use that software as well, which is great. So there's a lot of great things to say, but there's also a warning. And I had to speak a few years ago at a Congress. I was a keynote. Oh, I was so proud. There were 100 people in my room. There was another keynote and there were 4,000 people in his room. And he's, he was the former mayor of New York, Mike Bloomberg. And Bloomberg tells the story that when he was a mayor of New York, he has a bunch of scholars and, and scientists from Harvard and Yale. And they say, Mike, we need to do something about traffic congestion in Manhattan because, because of the... Um, congestion because of the traffic jams there are a lot of um, incidents accidents people are injured and some casualties so they say if you could ask google 
to tweak the algorithm of Google Maps slightly, let's say 20% randomizing, then people also go to the left and we will have less congestion, less incidents, less problems. Now Bloomberg says, I wrote a letter. I don't think he wrote himself, but anyway, I wrote a letter to Google and they never answered. I get it, they can't answer because if they tweak their algorithm for New York, they have to do it for Melbourne, they have to do it for Berlin, they have to do it for Brussels and they have to do it for La Valletta, right? So they can't. And then Mike Bloomberg, and he's not, not actually a socialist, he is shouting in that room, how does it feel that a private company of the West Coast is deciding how we are moving in the major city of the East Coast. And that's a quote I will never forget. So far, placemaking. Now let's move on to place marketing. By the way, this is a photo of the place where I am now for the moment. This is Antwerp in Belgium. For place marketing, I always explain it with a formula. Why a formula? Because it makes me look much more smarter than I really am. It looks like mathematics, but it's actually very simple. It says that the quality of a place or the performance of a place is the sum of your place experience plus your external communication plus your internal communication. And I think the first part of the comparison, everybody knows that we, living, we are living the times of experience, experiences and experiential marketing. I think most of you have heard about Pine and Gilmore. I'm not going to explain this model. I'm going to jump to the next slide. Um, that's what I do for a living, for instance, right? I tried to change minds. minds. Um, that's what I did in Ottawa, the capital of Canada. And they're always like, we have to sell Ottawa, right? Or Ottawa, like they say in English. And I'm not, no. Because if you are serious about experiences, this is just a commodity. Commodity means it's undifferentiated, so there is lower attraction, there is lower money coming to your place. What you need to do is you need to sell products like rafting. Okay, Frank, but rafting is not typical auto and it's a Canadian thing. Right, but you're the only city where you can do rafting. Wow, that's cool. People will be more attracted if there is a service uh, involved. And Ottawa um, attracts a lot of city trippers and city hoppers. So there are crash courses for people, urban people like me in half a day, they learn you how to raft or someone accompanies you. But then the experience is that Ottawa is the only G7 capital in the world where you can do rafting in front of Parliament Hill. And if you're lucky, Justin Trudeau will do his daily jogging and wave his hand to you. So I think you get that, right? Word of mouth is driven by good experiences or bad experiences. Now the external communications and here start all my tourism people to saliva because that's what they think that marketing is. We seem to have forgotten that marketing actually is about strategy. It's about development. It's about pricing. But anyway, people love their promotion. Um, I'm not a big fan of all these campaigns. I think they are good in copycatting. Um, when I give my students in New York like 50 brand activation videos, um, they beg me after five or six, please Frank, stop, it's all interchangeable. But there are also good examples. And I think there is a place for promotion, but it comes at the end of your marketing chain, right? Start with the head, the strategy, don't start with the tail, your promotion. I think Greenland did something very cool because this is not only promoting, it's also kind of developing even. Why Greenland may not be for you. This is about segmentation, right? People who read that, they start thinking, why could Greenland maybe not for me? And as you all know, Greenland, very, very vulnerable place, 30,000 people. So if they have too many tourists, they will be trampled. But you can do it also in another way. It's not only about campaigns and posters and billboards and online. Um, for instance, this is something what my company did. This is not a city, this is a state. It's called Colorado and that was their old map. Not a lot of fantasy here. Northwest, Southwest, Southeast, Northeast. That's how they call the counties. So we rebaptize these counties 
and now every county at least has in the core a sort of um, primary experience that they express. How did we do that? Well, a, our team was burned to the ground because we did like 26 workshops and we need to do them again. Um, but it really pays off, right? It really pays off to invest and take people seriously and give them feedback, what has been done with their input during these workshops. That's not the only thing we did, of course. Um, there's a lot of other uh, research techniques we used, but this is the final result. And the last one is really bringing placemaking into place marketing, internal communication. This is diehard permission marketing. Ask permission to your citizens what you can say to the world. Um, this is a strategy written by Singer Jungerstedt of Copenhagen, and I was coaching her. I was in the back involved in this strategy. I need to re-explain it all the time in America because I think we're closing all the borders in Europe before COVID. Um, but not so. What she actually wanted to say is tourism can only give value if the experience uh, for the visitors and the experiences for the resident is equally beneficiary for the two. So that is fair. It's about harmony, balancing between the, the local people and the visitors. Um, she also launched a new word, which is the local hood. And we're now 50 minutes and hey, this is my last slide. This is another case study. Um, I could pick a lot of things we do. We co-create almost everything with citizens. If it's online, if it's a uh, promotion, if it's a uh, development, this is, uh, is a strategy, but this is a research project. And I call it the place DNA report. And this is really an eye opener for many places on the planet. It's quite successful. The word DNA, although is misunderstood, the only thing it wants to say is the DNA is what do people of La Valletta talk about when they refer to La Valletta? What do people from Auckland talk about when they speak about talk, um, Auckland? So it's a sort of self-perceived image of the population. Um, that's something we do with uh, quantitative research, like a very classic survey, but also at least five workshops co-creation with citizens. Then we confront that with what is the world saying about you? That's the perceived city. And what are you telling to the world? There we have a deeper dive in the main communication channels of a place, uh, who are the main communicators and so on. Now you can understand, the smaller this intersection is, the weaker your reputation. And citizens totally get it. And this project, this methodology is actually born out of my personal uh, frustration because I used to work uh, as a strategist for a long time. And I was writing all these plans, I was writing all these strategies. And then I, um, worked also three, four years as a policy advisor. And then I understood what is happening with all these plans. They just end in the drawer of a CEO, of a politician. That's something only with this we could change. Like in Calgary, I end it with the mayor of Calgary. In Ottawa, I end it with the mayor of Calgary. How comes? Because there is a buzz going on. It's a grassroots kind of research and people are infused. They are taken seriously. And there is a sort of push bottom up and then a politician will react. So that's the way we do it. There is much more to talk about. Uh, I love to talk about COVID as well, but I leave it to one last thought. And if you allow me, I do it in my other national language. My favorite quote ever is from the French philosopher Michel Foucault, who once wrote, Vivre à la proximité pour devenir citoyen du monde. In English, you need to know your own neighborhood before you call yourself a world citizen. And I think that is very, very true. All place making, all place marketing should be permission making and permission marketing.
I leave it to that. Thank you.